Here we are with my old friend, colleague, and all of famer, Steve Flink, uh, after the Miami Master 1000. Good uh, morning for you and good afternoon for me. Uh, did you have a good Easter time with your family? I did, Yubaldo. I hope you did as well. And I know you're probably very sad this morning because you, you had to watch another sinner victory, an Italian player. You don't really like it when the Italians <laughs> win, right? Yeah. A disaster, a real disaster. I mean, I, I, I really, after almost 50 years, uh, I cannot bear this Italian winning uh, so much, so, so convincingly, because, I mean, he lost uh, uh, seven games in the last two matches, which means uh, uh, that he lost uh, less than two games for each set. 6-3, 6-1 uh, with uh, Medvedev, 6-1... Uh, no, six one, six two, actually. And, yes. And and uh, and uh, only four games with Dimitrov, who had beaten three top ten players. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm be almost unbelievable. It was. I mean, especially when you consider that early in the tournament he was down a set and five games all second set against Greek Spore, and and that was the dangerous moment for Sinner. After that, unstoppable. Yeah. And you know, you Bob, though, it's a combination of things. It's his his temperament. He's very calm on the court. He's very determined. Nothing seems to bother him. His game is so solid right now. Nobody can find any weaknesses, not even minor weaknesses. He moves so well. His serve is greatly improved from a year ago. It's I guess it's not difficult to understand. We already knew he was he was very very good. Now he's great because there's nothing to expose in him. And 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 so you they 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 feel like they have to play incredibly well to beat him, and and it's not happening. He's not losing very often. He's lost one match this year. Yeah, only one match, and uh, he lost actually uh, uh, three matches out of forty-five because since uh, he lost to Zverev, he has lost yeah. once to Shelton in Shanghai, but then he beat him immediately afterwards in in Beijing. Then he lost. Uh, to Djokovic in the ATP finals, but he beat him three times out of four. And then he has lost uh, the, his third match uh, in Indian West with Alcaraz. When, uh, me and, when me and you, we had some doubts about that uh, loss. We did. We shared the same view because Sinner in that match with Alcaraz won the first set 6-1, as you well remember. The long rain break, he comes back at 2-1, wins the last four games, he's rolling. Alcor they both played a good second set, but then early in the third, you could see that Sinner, he fell on his wrist. He didn't seem physically right in that third set, and so he wasn't able to keep it. it you know, he lost 6-3 in the third, I, and good performance from Alcaraz, very good performance. But that was not the best Sinner that day, and I, and he made, he made up for it in Florida, didn't he? I mean, he decided he wasn't going to lose two tournaments in a row. Yeah, yeah, well, he missed 27 forehands. If you think that yesterday versus Dimitrov, he didn't miss one single backhand, and he had missed uh, four uh, forehands at the beginning of the match, but then yes. almost uh, almost none afterwards, maybe three altogether more than those four. So seven forehands missed in the whole match, but no one backhand, I mean, which is unbelievable. I mean, not one bad single back and missed. Well, yeah, nothing, nothing, no, no unforced on that side, which is is astonishing. But you know, in turn, then he suddenly made Dimitrov, who had looked so good in his wins, uh, especially against Alcaraz, but also excellent against Zarev in the semis. He made Dimitrov look like some ordinary player because early in the first set. Uh, it was the only chance that Dimitrov had. He had a break point to go up 3-1, and he missed a forehand, not by much. And then Sinner holds on, and he from there, 6-3, six, 6-1, six, you know, 11 out of 13 games. And I, I felt like he, uh, it was, he was so good that he discouraged Dimitrov. Dimitrov didn't feel he could stay with him in the rallies. And, and also Sinner made, made Dimitrov – he, he – he forced him into a lot of backhand errors. You talk about how Sinner didn't miss a backhand himself. Well, Dimitrov missed a lot of backhands because Sinner would not stop playing balls to that side and letting him know that he wasn't gonna, not going to let him hit many forehands. So 
Sinner played the match pretty much on his own terms. Don't you think, you Ubaldo? The, the yes. pattern of them in his favor. Yes, but, you know, uh, we had uh, um, our contributor, Vanni Gibertini in Miami, and he did film uh, the practice of uh, uh, Yannick Sinner, uh, and he practiced with uh, Darren Cahill, and uh, uh, there was a movie, a film of, uh, a video of, uh, uh, let's say one minute, where uh, Cena was playing all one end, back end, sliced, you know, just to practice the way he should have played later on uh, with uh, against Dimitrov. And, and uh, uh, so he saw, I mean, his team and himself, uh, they are so professional. They study all the details and they like... Uh, they are like chess players. They exactly know what they have to do, uh, where to hit the balls, where to serve. When he played Medvedev, at the beginning, Medvedev decided to try to play aggressive. And instead of staying five meters behind the baseline, Medvedev tried to uh, play close to the baseline. And then what immediately seen thought? He thought to serve on the body. He was serving uh, right in the body of Medvedev. And Medvedev didn't yeah. have the time to move and play his usual shots. And that is the cleverness of uh, Sinner and the tactic of, that his team studies with him. Yeah, I agree. And, and let's face it, all of the other wins, it's five in a row now, but all of the other wins that he had over Medvedev were very, very close matches. Two sets down in the Australian Open final. He comes back a couple of finals last year. One was six and six. One was three sets. Then in the semifinals of the of the ATP finals was another three setter. So all of the wins were were well deserved, but they were close to beat Medvedev one and two. I mean, Medvedev has lost a couple of other matches in his career, if only winning three games. That never happens to him. So yeah, I think Medvedev, I've never seen him, Ubaldo, look so discouraged walking up to the net to shake hands with his opponent. I mean, he knew he'd been totally outplayed, but it has to be very worrisome for him. Alcaraz beat him in straight sets six and one in the Indian Wells final. Now this loss to Sinner. These guys are getting better and better. He's still in very consistent, but can he beat those two? And if Djokovic returns to form, can he beat Djokovic? I, I think poor Medvedev, who won the U.S. Open in 2021, is wondering when he's going to win another tournament again and certainly wondering when he's going to win another major again. And we are talking about someone who is still number four in the world. Yeah. Can you, yeah. Can you imagine the others, those one behind him? I mean, how difficult it should be. I mean, uh, and then there is another thing uh, I would like uh, a comment from you, okay? Uh, Yannick Sinner was asked many times uh, just before his finals, do you know that if you win, you will become number two in the world and so on? And he was always trying to, uh, to, to, to say that it was not so important for him because he said that, what is important is that the end of the year, now I can be number two one week, maybe again number three in another week, uh, and so on, which uh, which is a fair uh, uh, speech, you know. I, for, I mean, it, it's okay. We can agree with that. But uh, in Monte Carlo, for instance, being number one, it means that he will not be in the, on the same side of Djokovic. And it could happen that Alcaraz will be, could could happen, we don't know the draw, could be in the same half of Djokovic. So to be number two gives him some advantage or could give him some... Could, yeah. Advantage. But you know what, Ubaldo, he's right. When he, the, the point, the most important part of what you just said, I think, is that it's the end of the year is what really matters to him. And I'm I'm a big believer, and I have been for some time now, that he will end the year number one, barring injuries, unless he is out of the game for a long time with some injury that prevents him from playing in some of the majors. And otherwise, if he's healthy most of the year, he's already got the first major. He's now got a Masters 1000. He's got a third title as well. He's going to win at least four or five more tournaments this year. He's probably going to win 
another major. Wouldn't shock me if he won two more majors. And I don't think that Alcaraz can keep up with that consistency. And Djokovic, I don't think, is really going to try. He's not going to play enough. He's going to be picking his spots, trying to peak for the majors. He's already ended eight years at number one. He's not terribly interested in battling for number one again. His priorities are to add a few more majors if he can. So I think Sinner is so well set up because Carlos will have some great moments, some great tournaments. He'll win some titles. He may, I, I think Carlos can get a major this year too. He's won it the last two years. He has won one each U.S. Open and Wimbledon. But can he keep up with Sinner's consistency? I don't think so because Sinner is the kind of guy, he's so hard to beat each and every week and he doesn't take any tournament lightly that his results will be so strong throughout the year it's hard for me to imagine that he won't conclude the year as the top ranked player in the world well let's say steve uh, that first of all i hope you're right of course because i mean for us we in italy we'd never had the number two in the world not even a number three our top ranked player was uh, since 73 was adriano panatta was number four, but he was number four only for six weeks. Uh, and, and while uh, Sinner is already there in the top four uh, since uh, since November. Uh, and then, uh, so I, I understand what you say, and I hope you're right. At the same time, I cannot forget that uh, Novak Djokovic last year played four, four uh, slam finals, one, winning three out of them. And, and losing the one in Wimbledon when he had a, a break point in the fifth set, uh, which could have changed the, 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 res the final result. So, sure, we have the impression that Djokovic, as you say, just said, doesn't feel the same kind of motivation he had. Uh, someone says that... Uh, he has the quarrel with Goran Ivanisevic, with whom he split up, uh, because apparently, but I'm not sure about it, he said, uh, I would uh, prefer to uh, practice on clay in order to win the Olympic Games, the gold medal that I never won, and maybe even skip Wimbledon. And that uh, 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 Goran Ivanisevic could not accept it. Uh, and that's why they, I mean, apparently, I have no, uh, sh I'm not sure about it 100%. Uh, that shows that Djokovic may not even think about, you know, winning Wimbledon again. And, and if I don't have uh, the greatest motivation, uh, it would not be easy also to win Roland Garros. Uh, and now we no. to see how he will play in Monte Carlo where he went to practice much earlier than Sine. Sine would not practice before Thursday on Monte Carlo. Yeah, that's an interesting story about, I would be surprised if Djokovic didn't change his mind, Ubaldo, but I understand what, why, he, why he would possibly think that way. He's never won the Olympic gold medal. He's got seven Wimbledons, you know, at, and the schedule is crazy to go from all this whole clay court circuit, starting on Monte Carlo, as you just mentioned, all the way through the Roland Garros, get on the grass, have a couple of weeks to practice and then play Wimbledon and then go back to the clay for the Olympics is, is not, is it's, it, it's an insane schedule. And so maybe he feels that if he goes all out for Wimbledon, that he would cost him and win or lose, if he's deep into the draw at Wimbledon and he's back in another final, or maybe he can win it again that then he costs himself the chance for the gold medal because it's too difficult to then get back on the clay so soon and prepare for the, the Olympics. I can see why he toys with that in his mind. I hope he changes his mind because it may well be, Ubaldo, that the best opportunity Djokovic has, he could win. He's won two of the last three French Open. So I don't. I think he's going to be a very strong contender, put up a strong bid to defend his crown in, in Roland Garros. But Wimbledon, seven times, it's... You know, he almost won it in eighth last year, as you just mentioned, when he not only had that break point early in the fifth, but he also had set point to go up two sets to love and missed a very easy backhand. So uh, that was a heartbreaking loss to Alcaraz. But Wimbledon has been, you know, his second best major after Australia. So yeah. that shows you how much he wants the Olympic uh, gold medal. On the other hand, does he really want to forfeit the chance in one of his last years on the tour and maybe... 
he concludes his career in 2025. We don't know. But one of his last big chances to win Wimbledon, would he really give that up in the end? He'll wrestle with that decision. I hope in the end that he comes down in favor of playing Wimbledon. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, I have the feeling that especially in certain Eastern European countries, the Olympic Games are more important than somewhere else. Uh, for instance, I, I know that Shelton decided not to play the Olympics. Uh, the Americans sometimes didn't think uh, that the Olympics were so important, even if uh, when Andre Agassi won it in Atlanta, he said it was his most uh, biggest satisfaction and so on. But uh, hey, Ubaldo, we, Ubaldo, yeah. Ubaldo, just to prove to prove your point, you guess who was not there in Atlanta and, and when Agassi won that Olympic gold medal? Pete Sampras. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm well, just saying because he was thinking about the U.S. Open, he was more interested in being ready for the U.S. Open than to put all that effort into yeah. winning the Olympic gold. And and I kind of understand Shelton. Shelton feels like clay is his worst surface, so he would rather. You know, his priorities are different and everybody's going to react differently. But I, Djokovic is a special case when you've won, you know, 24 major titles, uh, you know, and and won at least three of every major, you know, and yet you've never won the Olympics. That does mean a lot to him. I'm sure of that. I'm absolutely certain how much it means to him. Uh, maybe uh, going back three years that he lost... Uh the famous finals at the U.S. Open with Medvedev because he was coming back from Tokyo where he tried right. to play the Olympics and uh, uh, and probably he, he asked too much to himself. Because, he did. You know, he, he was playing uh, not only singles but also mixed doubles in Tokyo yeah. uh, uh, and with Stojanovic, I think. And then, yeah. and, and then uh, you know, he lost... Uh, he lost in the semis. Uh, he lost in the semis, and he was destroying Zarev. He was up a set and 3-1, and then he lost seven or eight games in a row. The next yeah. thing you know, he's down 4-11 in the third, and he loses the match, and he didn't even win the third-place match against Karina Busta. So that was very disappointing for him, very deflating, because it's interesting, Ubaldo, when he won Wimbledon that year for the third, straight, for the third major, they asked him right after the match. Darren Cahill was doing the interview. What about the Olympics? Then he thought it was 50-50. He wasn't really sure he was going to play it. Looking back, I, 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 it's, it's interesting because I think that really was costly. It's a long trip. He ended up being disappointed, not because if he would have won against Zarev, he would have played Hatchinoff in the final. Sure, a sure win for Djokovic. Yeah. So uh, he let Zarev off the hook. And he beat Zarev, by the way, in the semifinals of the U.S. Open. He got even with him there in five sets. But... Yeah, that's a good point. They always have to. These are difficult decisions for the players, Yabal. The, the schedule is crowded enough every year. But when you throw the Olympics in, in the case of the last time, it was in the middle of the summer. And this time it's again back in the summer, but on clay, which makes it even more complicated because the players think they're at that point, they're supposed to be done with the clay court season at Roland Garros. So I'll be interested to see what Djokovic decides to do in the end. Yeah, and then, you know, in Tokyo, I was in Tokyo for the Olympics. It's, it was so hot. There were days when it was so hot and wet. We, uh, it was very, very difficult to play. There were people, players almost fainting. Yes. And, even, and, and, and uh, who knows how it will be Roland Garros in, uh, at the end of July. Because, because it could be very hot again. So, yeah. I mean, the climate uh, we, will not help. Uh, but, Ubaldo, um, if you were Goran Ivanisevic and you were having that discussion with Djokovic and Djokovic said to you, I'm, I think I'm not going to play Wimbledon because I want the Olympics. I, I can understand why he would disagree. But why, if you were Goran, would you not then say, OK, I disagree, Novak. I want you to play Wimbledon and I'm going to still try to talk you into it. But if this is what you decide. I'm going to do everything in my power to help you win that Olympic Olympic gold medal. I don't understand from even Isovich's end why he would then say, "Okay, then we we don't, I, I we don't see things eye to eye, and I think we should split up the professional partnership." I don't know either, but and I don't understand much either. But 
I don't know if there were other subjects because I mean, uh, Djokovic recently has changed uh, most part of his team uh, and uh, even, uh, you know, even the manager he had been for many, many years. It was an Italian, Dodo Artaldi. Uh, he, 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 he practically said, uh, uh, he decided to stop with him too and his uh, wife. Uh, so uh, I think uh, Djokovic, uh, he, he not, now he doesn't even say if he will hire another coach or if he thinks to do all on his, um, on his own which is uh, a little bit unusual now for a player who, who, like uh, Djokovic who had sometimes even two coaches at the same time. Yeah. So, so that, that probably is changing his mind, is changing his attitude. He likes to, he, uh, he has two small kids. Uh, uh, he wants to stay more with the family, but a, a, a a, a, a new Djokovic with without the old motivation is going to become weaker than the one we knew, I think. Well, you could be right, but I, I'm still convinced that he will put a lot of effort into the th three remaining majors plus the Olympics. We'll see about Wimbledon, but that he will he will show his best stuff and, and come away with at least, I still see him getting one of the big prizes ahead. Because I think he doesn't want uh, uh, he, he, he it's it's hard for me to imagine. I don't think he suddenly got old. In other words, all this talk about how he's old. Yes, he'll be thirty seven in May. But last year, as you said, you know, I mean, he's that close to winning all four majors. He loses the Wimbledon final narrowly. He wins the other three. He wins the Paris Masters one thousand. He wins the year end championships. It was a fantastic season. I, I think all that happened is you know he wasn't feeling a hundred percent. In, in Australia, you know, he had battling some kind of a cold or flu, and then he had the wrist injury coming in. And a couple of things contributed to that, plus Sinner peaked, and Sinner played brilliantly and beat him in the semis and won, beat Medvedev in the final. And then he took that time off, probably should have played in Dubai, but he went to Indian Wells a little cold and had that terrible loss to some obscure Italian. I won't even mention his name. <laughs> <laughs> well, Nardi is won yesterday a challenger uh, tournament in Naples, and is is uh, today he has his best ranking is number seventy five. Good, so, good. So and he's only twenty years old. So I mean, uh, uh, to be honest, uh, we have eight Italians in the top hundred, and Berrettini is out at the moment, but he's going to play this week in Marrakesh. And uh, I want, I'm curious to see what Berrettini will do because he could have you a bother, chance. question yes. for you. you. Have you ever felt this way in your life? There's an expression called an embarrassment of riches, meaning you have so <laughs> many. And that's what you have in Italy right now. This is a problem you've never had before, but I'm happy for you because you can see that Sinner, well, Sinner will, of course, be the king. But he'll be uh, hopefully Berrettini can get healthy again and the rest of these guys can perform well. And Sinner will have a good supporting cast, as they say. But you've never had it so good in Italian tennis unless we can go back to 2015 and an all women's Italian Open, all women's final at the U.S. Open for Italy. That was nice. And uh, obviously Panetta won it, but uh, over Vinci. But uh, for men's tennis, you've never had it so good. Would you agree? No, no, I do agree. And uh, someone uh, meeting me says that in a way I, I deserve it because I was faithful for 50 years to the tennis. And, uh, yeah. and, after, and after I saw my first Roland Garros was 1976 and Panata won it. And I thought, uh, oh, I am very lucky. Who knows how many slams we will win in the future. And then I had to wait 47 years to see to see Sinner winning the Australian Open and one But you, you bother. my next question for you because you you said you hope I'm right about Sinner can yeah. you imagine a scenario where I guess the only realistically to me this year given that I don't think Djokovic would play enough I just don't see as I said I don't see him really going after the number 1 ranking the way he did last year 
So to me, it comes down to either Sinner or Alcaraz. Medvedev would have a chance, but he, I, I don't see it for him either. I, I see him, you know, three or four in the world where he's been. So to me, can you imagine a scenario where Sinner would not finish this year at number one? Well, I'm curious to see how he will react to the clay season, because even if the clay season is quite short, I mean, he, last year he made semifinals in Monte Carlo, losing to Rune, but then he lost uh, to Serundolo in Rome, and he lost to Altmaier in the second round in Paris, which yeah. means that he, if he does a little better, he will earn points uh, in terms of rankings. And uh, so I am optimistic, but I cannot re forget that Carlitos Alcaraz, when he plays his best tennis, seems to have more variety, um, more, uh, let's say, he's probably less consistent because he can have ups and downs, even in the same match, more than, than Sinner. Uh, but uh, his tennis is probably more complete. Uh, then I don't know. You know, Ubaldo, I slightly disagree with you there. I, I think that Carlos is more uh, spectacular with his shot making. Maybe yeah. he has a few more shots, more virtuosity, as they say. But Sinner is so disciplined. And and uh, to me, the, the biggest difference to me, Uvaldo, Sinner doesn't beat himself. Uh, not these days, not anymore. He may be a few years ago. He will never beat himself. And he keeps his game at a consistently high level. And he doesn't have the ups and downs. That that's why I can't imagine he. It won't be him at number one because Carlos will. I think will have some periods during the year where he's unbeatable. Certain tournaments like he was in Indian Wells, but he'll also have days like he did against Dimitrov in this tournament where he was beaten really soundly. Great performance from Dimitrov, but Carlos lost two and four. He was barely in that match. He came back from one four down in the second break point down all the way to four all and still lost. 6-4. He's, he's sometimes too creative for his own good, and he can get in his own way. Sinner does not get in his own way. Sinner, right? And I also think, Yuvaldo, that you won't see results like those you just mentioned on the clay this year. I'm not saying he wins every clay court tournament. He won't. But I think you're going to see much more stable results from Sinner on the clay. It maybe isn't his best surface. He's better on hard. But I, I think that he was in something of a slump there last year in the period you described on the clay. And the Runa match was a little bit disheartening because he was very close to very, very close match. Disappointing loss. But I don't see anything like that this year. I think he'll be right in the thick of things on the clay. And as you said, then he put picks up a ton of ranking points and then you get him back out on the grass where he was in the semis of Wimbledon and over to the hard courts in the summer after the Olympics and. I just don't see how we're not going to see him always in the latter stages, almost always in the latter stages, but also winning more tournaments than Carlos. Let's put it that way. Winning more tournaments and having more consistent results in the tournaments that he does not win. Yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right. I, you know, I, in Italy, there was a moment when everybody was thinking, oh, Alcaraz is, is of another level. But then... Uh, well, and it wasn't maybe it was maybe a little exaggerated if you think that Alcaraz won the U.S. Open, but only after saving a match point versus Sinner. Right. But but the progress that Sinner has done in the last uh, uh, six seven months, uh, uh, nobody no 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 other player has done the same. I mean, he's serving unbelievable. Uh, his his shots are. Uh, heavy. I mean, the, the players who, have, who, who play him, they say that they have to have a very strong arm to 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 be able to to react to, to his shots, and and that uh, uh, is important. Then uh, and, when, and he he to, when he has when he has to make a passing shot, he's never afraid to make it forehand or backhand. He, he he never misses a passing shot, which is normally difficult. Yeah, and made a couple of beauties yesterday. One forehand down the line pass and another backhand down the line against Dimitrov. And Dimitrov look, had that look. It was incredulous. He couldn't believe what he'd just seen. The speed and then the execution on the passing shots. 
No, he never complicates things, Ubaldo. He keeps things simple in his mind. He doesn't try to, he's not out there to have the gal, have the fans standing on their feet because they saw a shot they'd never seen before. He's just out there to win. And he plays the right shot at the right time. And I, I just feel right now he's in, impenetrable. There's just nothing that can phase him. That's not to say there won't be a few that, that he couldn't have some tough moments during the year and you, they can lose confidence from a surprising loss. But he's, I think he's pretty unshakable. And, and he, uh, the Cahill, is, Cahill has been a big help to him in my, in my mind with the, the way he thinks about matches. You talked about the preparation. Cahill also prepares for him by going and watching every match, scouting every match, every opponent. And Cahill, of course, as we talked about last time, Cahill is, he's in the, t in the television booth a lot too. So when he's not there for Sinner and he's calling commentary, he's watching Sinner's opponents and yeah. picking up even more information. So I think, you know, he has a setup right now. He has a team around him and he has, and he, he can count on them. And more importantly, he can count on himself. Yeah, yeah, and and then you know uh, when uh, you, you beat Medvedev five times in a row, okay, four times it were close matches, and now yeah. not even close. Then when he won the, his first Masters uh, one thousand in Toronto, uh, he lost five games versus Demi Nauer. So he gets to the finals. He doesn't tremble. He doesn't. Uh, he's not afraid. He, he wins. Uh, he doesn't miss, uh, you know, one game or two. If he, 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 he wins easy, and that uh, that is not normally it doesn't happen to somebody who is 22 years old, uh, and uh, uh, in a way, winning, making his first success. You know, I mean, he's not uh, uh, there since 10 years with a lot of a lot of experience, but he seems experienced. That's that's uh, quite strange, you know. Yeah, he he's mature, but he's mature beyond his years. He 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 seems much more like a 27, 28 year old than twenty two. Yeah. And uh, listen, I I I feel like there would have been a big disappointment in Ubaldo if he hadn't won the Australian because he was building for it and he'd beaten Djokovic in the semis. And if he had, would have lost that match to Medvedev, it could have set him back a bit, but he didn't. He made a gallant comeback from two sets down to win it in five. <clears throat> and, and now I feel that that was, that was just, that was a relief to him. And now he just does he, now he just feels like, okay, there's no pressure. I'm just going to try to win every match, every tournament I play. And he doesn't doubt himself. And, and he's, uh, he's on his way. He, you needn't worry, Ubaldo. You don't have anything to worry about with Sinner. He will be keeping you very busy over the yeah. next Five to ten years. Well, well, between Indian Wells and Miami, I tell you, my my sleeping hours were very small. You know, <laughs> I, could, I had to follow in the middle of the night, write during the day, uh, do videos and everything. Uh, all the radios and TVs are calling me. Uh, I mean, uh, thanks to to Sinner, I my the Ubi Ten is doing well in terms of traffic. At the same time, I'm getting older and I have to work more, which probably maybe, I don't know if I, if I, I couldn't forecast that. Well, you're, you know. you're getting older, but you have a young mind. Okay, I hope so, I hope so. Look, what else about the tournament, the men's tournament that impressed you? I mean, I, I thought, for instance, this Hungarian Marozan is quite an interesting player, you know? Uh, he plays different from most people. He beat, uh, uh, you know, uh, easy Rune who was not feeling well. Then Popperin, then uh, uh, Deminor, then with Zverev he gave him a good fight. Uh, so I mean, it, it's a new name. Uh, I don't know what where he can reach, where he can go. Last year he had beaten Alcaraz in Rome, and uh, nobody knew him uh, apart from me. Since he lives in Florence, I mean, lives. <laughs> he he plays in a club, in a tennis club, uh, match ball in uh, next to my house, fifteen minutes far from my house, and so he was playing for the local national team, and uh, and everybody liked him 
very much, but nobody really knew him until he beat uh, Alcaraz in uh, in Rome. It's true. And but then after that, we didn't see that much of this tournament to me was validation for him to do that on hard court, Ubaldo, and, and beat the players of that college of Demonor, who's had such a good year and he's such a tough out, as they say. And he handled him and he and he made uh, Zareb work very hard, even though it was straight sets. So I feel like, yeah, I, I, I want to see a bit more of him. But that was a big step to me because. He caught Carlos off guard when he beat him last year, and he's had some good results since, and he played pretty well in Indian Wells. But now this was this was a the best tournament that he's had of, of that level, the, the best string of results. So I yeah. want to see now. Now he goes back out onto the clay where he should be very happy with a lot yeah. of confidence. But you're right. Yeah. He made he made quite an impression. But, of course, you bother the, the guy that really – was sort of the star, the to unsung, the hero of the tournament, and he said himself he felt like he won it, even though he didn't win it was Dimitrov, yeah. because uh, the the way, he, especially what he did, for, uh, uh, <clears throat> he was able to squeak out the match with Herkosh, who got a bad break. He, Herkosh touched the net with his foot in yeah. two all in the third set tie break, and and he realized I think he was so angry and so upset, but he knew he'd done it. Uh, it would have been a winner and a winning point for him. And instead, he, he loses the point by touching the net with his foot and didn't really emotionally recover. And Dimitra went on to win that tiebreaker seven points to three and close it out. And then the match he played against Carlos, that's about, I don't think I've ever seen him play better for two sets, taking these back in return so early, the one-handed back in and hitting inside out back in return winners. And and he had kind of had Carlos on his back foot the whole match. Carlos said afterwards he felt like a 13-year-old. And, and that was a great compliment for him to say that because usually he can figure things out with sometimes with the help of his coach, Juan Carlos Ferrero, but he, he was befuddled on the court against Dimitrov. And then, of course, Dimitrov followed up with a tough three set win where he didn't lose his serve against Zarev. You know, the one set he lost was a tie break in the second set. So that was impressive to me, too, that he had no letdown after Carlos. Finally, in the final, Sinner brought him back down to earth. But that was, to me, much more about Sinner than it was about Dimitrov, where Sinner was so good, and he'd come off the, that win in the semis that we talked about over Medvedev. So I feel like Dimitrov, the way he played last fall, where he had wins over Alcaraz and Medvedev, and, and the way he's starting this year now, and back in the top 10, and we saw him at number three in the world in 2017 when he won the year-end championship, Jubala. But I feel like now at 32, he's an even better player. And, yeah. and, and I, I thought his run to the final was really the, the highlight of the tournament for me. Yeah, yeah, it is true. Uh, don't, and we don't have to forget also that uh, he, against Tabilo, uh, the first round, the Chilean Tabilo, he was yes. on one set and 5-2 in the tiebreaker of the second set. Yeah, and there's a certain I, I There's this writer I know from America. I, I, don't, I can't remember his name. He did something for UB Tennis about that. He mentioned that match in his report for <laughs> UB Tennis. I'm not sure who that guy is. He looks a little bit like me. But no, that that's an important match to refer to, Yavala, because imagine that. It would have been a very disappointing tournament out early. And the funny thing about that match is, yes, down a set and 2-5 in the tiebreak in the second, he pulls it out. He never lost his serve in the match. So he was in served 23 aces. It was a very good serving day for, for yeah. uh, Dimitrov. But in the first two sets, he didn't do enough on the returns, and he was getting outplayed from the baseline. So that was a critical win that got him going and then led to the to the string of matches we already mentioned. But I feel like He's, he's very good on clay, you bother. There's nothing wrong with Dimitrov on clay. So I expect some good results from him starting in Monte Carlo. Well, he will be 33 years old uh, on uh, uh, May the 16th, yeah, uh, yeah. which, is, uh, which is the same day of uh, uh, Gabriela Sabatini's birthday. Uh, so I always remember the 16th of May because in Italy, we have a calendar where every day is baptized by a saint. And on the 16th May, the saint is called Sant'Ubaldo. You may not know that, but that's I didn't why... know that. <laughs> so that's why I always remember the day of birth of uh, Gabriela Sabatini. And now also the one of Greg, Gregory Dimitrov. Uh, apart from that, there, was, there is another player that I 
uh, always think that he could win everything, and he wins a little less than everything, and it is uh, Sasha Zverev. Because Zverev, in my opinion, has great qualities. Uh, against Dimitro, he was playing probably a little bit uh, too much defensive, in the sense that he was too much behind the, the baseline. And uh, he has good shots. He has a great backhand, a great serve. Uh, he's not making all those double fours he was making years ago. But still, uh, there is always something missing to him. Uh, uh, and I was afraid he could beat Dimitrov because against uh, Sinner, he has a best, better record. Four, four wins out of five. Included the last one at the U.S. Open, the quarters. Of yeah, the he was a little lucky. He he was a little lucky at the U.S. Open, and and I think Sinner was having cramp problems. Yeah, Sinner was very hindered physically. It was a great match, but I don't think he would beat him right now. But I agree with your 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 main point is sometimes it seems that Zarev does not do himself justice. In other yeah. words, this he, he he had a good opportunity to make the final here. His results are very consistent. Once again, you look back in Australia, you know, where he beats Carlos in the quarters and he's got uh, Medvedev down two sets and he was, couldn't finish him off. So there's been some difficult losses for him that could make a big difference. He's made a good comeback after that awful injury he suffered against Rafa at the French Open two years ago. I give him yeah. credit for the way he's worked his way back. But, uh, yeah, some opportunities are passing him by. And you, you, at this tournament, as you said, and the ones that I mentioned, and, and the other thing I'd add, you, Baldo, you're right about it. He's got a great backhand. He's got a great serve. The double faults are complete, almost completely eliminated. Forehand can still be a little shaky. And at the end of the first set of that Dimitrov match, uh, on set point down, he, he hit a horrible forehand down the line mishit that he – you know, yeah. once in a while, he, he loses faith in it. He seems to back off of it. And the forehand can still be a little of a liability at times. But otherwise, I mean, he's he gets in. He's averaging, I think, over 70% on first serve percentage and still going 126, 128 miles an hour. Not always going for aces, but he's very hard to break with that consistency on serve. And We'll see, you bother. He's a great clay court but player, you know, too. You know, uh, Steve, I have read, and I haven't talked to him personally, but apparently he has uh, he suffers of diabetes, and uh, sometimes he has to make himself an injection uh, with insulin. Uh, I don't know if you call it insulina, insulin. Yes, in, yes, yeah. insulin, right, right. Insulin. And, and apparently, even during the match that he played the versus... Uh, Dimitrov, there was one moment when the TV showed him taking this injection and, it, and someone had told him uh, in other moments that he shouldn't do it on court. But then uh, he said, I cannot, uh, uh, you know, when I have my crisis, I have to do it immediately. So so that that could be an explanation why yeah. uh, uh, also in Australia or in New York or so, he has sometimes some letdowns, sudden letdowns. That could be. Yeah, that that could that could well be. And 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 I haven't ever heard him talk about it in any great detail. But you're right. There has been some reporting on this. They were talking about it on on the telecast and tennis channel yesterday a bit as well. So yeah, that's that's not an easy thing to deal with. That's you know that that would affect anybody, and it may have something to do with some of the the losses. And uh, he said he wasn't feeling well in the fifth set against Medvedev in Australia. Maybe that was something to do with the diabetes. So I, I think we, we need to cut him some slack. I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. I'd like to talk to you very briefly because we are almost running out of time about uh, that match that I saw between our uh, Musetti and your Shelton, because Shelton plays unbelievable well, certain shots, but he, he, sometimes he plays like he, uh, he's not playing with the mind, I mean, uh, with the head. I mean, it's, uh, it's like he likes uh, to be spec to make uh, spectacular shots. The, the opposite of, Le of uh, Sinner. I mean, uh, he, he, he wants to, to show off, uh, play unbelievable, strong serve, uh, a uh, huge forehand, but then miss maybe three shots one after the other with no 
some, no, no strategy behind. What do you think? Yeah, there are times when I feel, I think he sized it up well. I think he, there are times when he's a little undisciplined and a little too adventuresome. And I thought he let me set you off the hook a bit in that match. He was up a break in the second set. I thought he could have won that match. Uh, and But it, 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 a lot of it has to do with shot selection and, and discipline. And he was locking it there. He loses some of the, he's a great competitor. What I like about him the best, you bother, is he always fights. He's got a lot of spirit, and it, it's very hard to finish him off. He he will stay with you to the bitter end. On the other hand, he he there's a lot of self-inflicted wounds. The mistakes that he makes are are sometimes very questionable, and that's something I think his father can help him a lot with. And, and he's growing up fast, and he finds himself right up there in the top twenty now, and ready to try to make a move to the top ten. But I, he, that's a match, frankly, with all due respect to your Italian player, that's a match Shelton should win on hard courts. Yeah. Okay. Do you agree? Do you agree with that? Yeah, 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 yeah. I think Musetti could be the favorite on clay and, yeah. not, and the underdog on hard court. Instead, he yeah. won on, uh, also on hard court. And in, you know, that I uh, didn't uh, really expect also because Musetti had never won this year two matches in a row and uh, yeah. instead he beat Safiulin uh, before and then Shelton afterwards and uh, well then he lost 6-3, 6-3 to Alcaraz which was normal. Yeah. Okay, listen, thanks a lot to my old friend, colleague and Hall of Famer Steve Link. Uh, in the next video later on we will talk about a ladies tournament where an American girl won the Miami Open. Thanks. Uh, ciao, Steve. Ciao, Ibado. What did we do? 45 minutes?